Hello, Bermuda, and welcome to This Week in Government. I'm your host, Tarai Trott. Today, we are pleased to have with us the Premier and Minister of Finance, the Honorable David Burt, JPMP. On February 16th, the Premier delivered an extensive budget statement that touched on a number of matters that affect our economy. The theme of this year's budget is investing in our people and our future. It touched on job creation, diversification, balancing the budget, support for social programs, and improving our infrastructure and the welcoming of new ferries, to name a few. Today, we're very happy to have the Premier with us to discuss some of the important aspects of the 2024-25 budget. Mr. Premier, welcome to the program. Uh, it's great to be here, it's all right. Mr. Premier, you delivered a very comprehensive budget statement the other day that uh, had some very good news, such as uh, freezing health insurance, for example, um, upgrades to our national infrastructure, and affordable housing, to name a few. And most importantly, it was a balanced budget. I want to get you to start by recapping the sheer significance of this particular budget statement. Well, I think the most important thing that matters to Bermudians who will be watching this program is what does a balanced budget mean to them and to their future. And what it means is that the government will stop borrowing money for the first time since 2003. That is certainly an accomplishment in and of itself, and it's been done through years of hard work while also making sure that we're making the investments in social services which are necessary. Now that we are no longer borrowing, it will allow us to continue to increase our investment in our people and our future, and this budget sets the stage for that with a record investment, uh, first time, I think highest in 15 years, in capital account spending, making sure that we take care of rebuilding our infrastructure, and one of the things that you mentioned at the top, we, because of our great financial performance that we've had over the past few years, we've borrowed less money than we've expected to borrow, and we're trying to return some of those funds back to persons, and we've done it this year by making sure that no one will see an increase in the standard premium rate, which is a government portion of every health insurance plan in the country, saving everyone $540 this upcoming year. I looked at the budget myself, it's around 50 pages, and I would imagine that most people out there watching probably would not have had the chance to read through it fully. And on that note, can you just sum up some of the most important initiatives contained in it, if you had to just explain it to someone? Well, I would say the balanced budget, as I mentioned before, to make sure that we're not borrowing funds anymore. The fact that we are investing a significant amount in capital expenditure this year, the highest since 2009, 2010. So that is something that is certainly, I think that matters to persons because we recognize that years of underinvestment in infrastructure are taking its toll. And in addition to that, there is support for a number of things that were inside of our throne speech. So whether that deals with our youth, whether it deals with our creative sector, whether that deals with additional capital funds to support the hospital and education reform, all of those things are what's inside of the budget statement. I think what's also important to note is that our economy grew by 6.4% in 2022. We've surpassed pre-pandemic levels, which is certainly a place where we wanted to be. We're actually above where we were expected to be during the pandemic, and that has allowed us to deliver that relief on health insurance costs while also investing an additional $10 million into affordable housing, and that is on top of the $15 million that have already been committed. And speaking of what's inside of a budget, I mean, most people probably uh, don't understand what it takes uh, internally to create a national budget. They would only see, you know, the end result. Uh, can you give us any insight into, you know, what does it take to create a national budget? Well, certainly. I mean, the budget statement is the statement in support of the, as it's officially called, the estimates of revenue and expenditure. And the, that book is rather thick. It's about 400 pages, and it covers every single government department, listing out the salaries for the government department, how much they're going to spend on supplies and other matters, the revenues that the individual departments bring in. And over the next few weeks in the House of Assembly, we will be debating all of those matters before we finally pass the budget. But um, the preparation starts in earnest in October of the private prior year, where departments go ahead, work with their ministers to put together budgets. Limits are set by cabinets when we take a look at 
how much money we're expected to bring in, whether or not we are going to raise taxes or not, and what if we are going to raise taxes, what are the taxes that we're going to raise in order to meet the spending commitment. So that's the overall purview, but I think it's important to note that it's not just the Minister of Finance that puts together the budget, of course, it's the dedicated ministers and the public officers that are working with the Budget Office and the Ministry of Finance to put together that big book, which does amount to about 400 pages. And when it comes to the actual allocations, Premier, people may wonder, how does that work? in terms of deciding which uh, ministries get which amount, for example? Mm -hmm. Is it a matter of a list of priorities or is it a matter of need? Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly based on the priorities of the government. And one of the things that this government has done is that we've continued to try to balance the burden. And we try to reduce the burden of taxes on those who can least afford it. One of the things that I covered inside of the budget statement was that someone who's making $48,000 a year would have paid $9,000 less in payroll taxes since we were elected. That means a family, $18,000 savings. That is a big deal. The average worker would have saved over $10,000 since, or the average family would have saved over $10,000 since we've been in office. And so from that perspective, it's important to recognize that what we have done is that we have made sure that we provided relief. But on the matters of priority, we prioritize making sure that we invested in healthcare, invested in education funding, and also investing in social services. So whether that be the services for children that are aging out of care with the independent living program, or whether or not that be the matters which are being funded in this budget in relation to domestic violence. Those are things which are the priorities of the government, which are stated inside of each year's throne speech, and where we have to make sure that we put the funds behind those promises so that they can be executed successfully. And now, Premier, reaching a, a, reaching a uh, balanced budget, now that's a significant achievement. And I'm trying to get you now to you know, tell us a bit why it's so important that the government try to balance a budget and more importantly you know lower the the deficit well the deficit is the thing that is the amount of money more that you spend than what you take in and this year we're expecting to take in enough money that will fund the day-to-day -day operations of government that will also fund our interest payments on debt and that will also fund our very ambitious capital program and it's important to note that this balanced budget has been achieved without any increases in taxes or fees. So the tax cuts that we put in place last year, which reduced taxes for every local business and 86% of the workforce remain in effect. And so I think that's an important point to note. And some will ask, how can you balance a budget if you're not increasing taxes? That is due to the fact that the economy is growing more jobs are being created. There were a thousand jobs created last year that was on top of 500 that were created the year before. As we're recovering from the pandemic, we're expecting additional job growth this year, which I can touch on later. And so from that aspect, but the key point is that as time goes on, as you have savings, you can reduce long-term debt and when you reduce long-term debt, that means that you reduce the interest payments on that debt. And when you reduce those interest payments, that means rather than you allocating money to pay your interest, you can allocate money for programs and investments. That's why it is important to reach a balanced budget. And in this case, the government is no longer borrowing money. And that means that our debt will only continue to come down in the coming years. I'm going to get you to sort of rate your own or grade your own report card so to speak, for a second here. If you had to assess the fiscal performance of the country over the mm -hmm. past 12 months, mm -hmm. what would your assessment be? Well, the fiscal performance over the last 12 months has been excellent. Now, fiscal is dealing with budgets and finances. The economy itself on a whole is still being challenged with the recovery from the pandemic, and certainly the costs of living increases of which Bermudians have had to bear. And that's why it's so important to hold the line on things like healthcare, where this is the third year that we're freezing the government portion of everyone's health insurance bill, which means that with all the other pressures that people are having with food and others, the government is not putting additional stress with an increase in our health insurance funds. But a perfect example of how our fiscal performance has been seen 
Last year when I went to Parliament, I said that the deficit for last year would be $77 million. That was in February of 2023. This year when I went to Parliament, I said that deficit is only going to be $28 million. That means that on our fiscal performance, we performed $49 million better than we expected to do. And that is due to strong revenues, which are coming in due to economic growth, and tight fiscal management to ensure that we are not overspending. And I think what you've seen over the years since we've been in office, we have always managed to stay within our expense lines on both capital and also on current expenditure while exceeding our targets on revenue. And that is the reason why our financial performance has been as good as it has been. And we've been able to return some of that great performance to the public in the form of freezing health insurance bills. And is there anything more you would like to say about how this budget uh, contributes to helping Bermudians with the rising cost of living? Well, it does not increase any taxes. It doesn't increase any fees. It provides that freeze on health insurance premiums, but it also continues the programs in which we put in place previously, such as the tax cuts that were in place are going to remain. So people are going to see more of the money of which they earn remain in their pocket so they're able to keep up with global inflation. And in addition to that, there are the investments in those key and critical programs which are necessary for the vulnerable in our society. So when we're talking about the impacts of economic growth and the challenges that people will face with affordable housing. This is another commitment of the government understanding the needs of the community and making sure that we put funding towards those needs to address those challenges. Premier, I'm going to pause that conversation right here to allow us to take a quick break. You're watching This Week in Government, and we are talking to the Premier and Minister of Finance, the Honorable David Burt. We'll be right back after these words. Bermuda is embarking on a journey to become a leader in zero emission transportation in the region. The Ministry of Transport is inviting all Bermudians to be a part of this historic transition. I'm so happy that I'm a proud owner of an electric vehicle. Because we live in Somerset and we were driving to Devonshire, we were approximating about three to $400 a month in gas. I have solar panels on my roof and when I charge up my car on a sunny day, it costs me absolutely nothing. We were very aware of what was going on with climate change and we just wanted to be kind of ahead of the game. And EVs are so much fun to drive. That's another reason why we enjoy our EV. Want to learn more about the policy? Then please visit www.forum.gov.bn. This has been a message from the government of Bermuda. And welcome back, where we are continuing our discussion with the Premier and Minister of Finance on the 2024-25 budget. Mr. Premier, supporting young people is another initiative that features heavily in this budget statement. We see increased funds for elite athletes. We see funds, more funds for scholarships and grants. And training, workforce, workforce development, for example, will be um, pushing forward with a program called uh, Makers Spaces. Uh, can you give us some more of your take on what this budget does for our young people? So I think that it's important that we look back on what the Progressive Labor Party government has done since it was elected. When we came in in 2017, there was a deliberate focus in our first budget in making sure that we made education more accessible, that we made training more accessible, that we increased apprenticeships and scholarships, and made sure we put additional investment into tackling the root causes of crime, which means dealing with young people inside of the communities and the places where they are before they make it. Now let's fast forward a number of years, and you've seen that one of the things we're able to report was that there are record numbers of Bermudians that are working in international business. And it's important that I raise this because it's a question of you have to make the investments and give time for those investments to pay off. And we are seeing the results of those investments of which have been made for the government. We are continuing on that, whether it is funding education reform, not only on the work side, but also 
additional funds to renovate and upgrade schools and upgrade equipment, whether it is the continued advancement and enhancement of our scholarships, of which we are putting in place to make sure that more persons have the opportunity to attain tertiary education. It's continuing our initiative to make sure that everyone can go to Bermuda College to upgrade their skills. And finally, the matter which you spoke about with makerspaces, which is with the Department of Culture, where, the, where one of the things that we do often is we do these lunch and learns and we listen to persons who come and talk. I was with the Minister of uh, Response for Culture and the uh, creative says that we don't have a space that's dedicated for us so we can go ahead and show our wares, do our things, create, it's very hard. And we said, let's bring everyone together. And so we promised that in the throne speech and now in this budget we're delivering those funds to make sure that we can keep the promises of which we've made. Because we have a vibrant creative community here of young persons, and not so young in some cases, and we want to ensure that they are supported. Elsewhere, Premier, the economy is set to get a boost from a number of construction projects that are to come online. Um, you mentioned, for example, Brookfield Place, Fairmont Southampton, and Morgan's Point, to name a few. Uh, just briefly give us uh, uh, your take on how these construction projects will spur the economy forward. Well, one of the spaces that we have not seen as heavy a growth is in construction. Construction has been steady and it has been continuing, but one of the things that we haven't had are significant large projects. That is about to change. We see demolition works happening on Front Street for Brookfield Place, which is a investment in Bermuda's economy and a vote of confidence in Bermuda's economy. We've seen the work that has commenced on the Fairmont Southampton site, which is expected to add 700 jobs during construction, and that's on top of the 200 jobs during construction that Brookfield is set to add. In last year's budget statement, I spoke about Morgan's Point, and I spoke about the fact that, unfortunately, the government had to cover the guarantee which was made by the previous government, which has cost payer, taxpayers over $200 million. Now we are finalizing the plans. The first phase will be the work to complete the five buildings that are there, adding 35 rental units to our stock, which are high-end housing, which will help to relieve some of the pressure that is coming from international business and the growth we're seeing in international business. But then we'll move on to the next phase, which includes apartments and retail space for everyone. And so from that aspect, we're pleased to be moving ahead with that project because in the short term, there'll be a construction boost, but over the long term, there's a housing boost and other things that are contained there. Premier, if I can talk about another topic that was a major feature of the budget, the corporate income tax, mm -hmm. um, which was a milestone for the government and which was lauded by many people across all sectors in the country. You know, there's been some speculation mm -hmm. that this uh, corporate income tax may be delayed or revamped. Uh, I want to invite you to set the record straight. Well, happy to do that. We have had no indication that there's any change in approach from the OECD. The expectation is that the global minimum tax will go live on the 1st of January 2025. Bermuda's way to meet that is by introducing a corporate income tax on large multinational corporations. We've done that in line with um, in the global standards. And one of the things that I spoke about in the budget statement is that this is a fundamental change in the way in which we collect revenue for the government of Bermuda. And it's important that Bermuda manage those funds well. That's what the Tax Reform Commission is working on. Inside of the budget statement, I committed to enshrining the recommendations of the Tax Reform Commission into law so that we can make sure that the benefits that may accrue to the country over the years with a corporate income tax could be shared by future generations of Bermudians. But one of the key points that I pointed to in the budget statement is the fact that this will allow us to fundamentally restructure the way that taxes are collected in this country and reduce the burdens that lead to increased prices in Bermuda. So one of the examples I said was if we eliminate customs duty on fuel, for instance, that will save each household $300 a year on their um, on their power bills. When we talk about reducing customs duty on food, on other things which factor into increased costs in the country, I think that those are the types of things that Bermudians want to know. They hear about corporate income tax, they may not worry. They wonder, how will this affect us? This government is committed to maintaining its record of returning 
funds and reducing the burden of working people in this country, as we have done since 2017. And the corporate income tax will give us another opportunity to ensure that we reduce those taxes so that people can have a better standard of living in Bermuda. Premier, I want to turn the attention, if I can, to the Mortgage Guarantee Program, mm -hmm. which uh, for those who don't know, it's a pilot program, a partnership between the Bermuda government and the Bermuda Commercial Bank, um, which I understand is a, it's been very successful so far. And now you've said the program will, in future, will expand or has already expanded into other banks. Mm -hmm. um, can you, what can you say more about that? Program. Well, um, on the uh, matter related to the mortgage guarantee program that is with the Bermuda Commercial Bank, there may be future opportunities to expand to other banks, but on the mortgage guarantee program, 49 Bermudians are on their path towards home ownership with the lowering of interest rates and with the reduction of the down payment which is necessary to secure your first home. But what we've also done is we said that we've expanded it, so phase two was for public officers. In the budget statement, I mentioned that this will also expand now to employees of Quangos and also part-time regiment soldiers. And it's important to note that this is to allow persons to transfer their mortgages to this preferred rate. But there will be many people who will be watching and say, well, I'm not a government employee or a Quango. What has the government done to benefit me? And in the budget statement, we also made it clear that a couple of years ago, we removed taxes on mortgage transfers. And this means that some banks have raised interest rates for Bermuda, others have not. And if you're with a bank that has increased your mortgage rate, your interest rate, you can shop around for your mortgage at one of these banks that are charging a lower rate of interest on mortgages, and you can move your mortgage without having to pay taxes to the government of Bermuda because we got rid of that tax. And what we have seen to rise, those persons who have taken advantage of this have saved thousands of dollars a year. And so I encourage every Bermudian, especially those who are challenged because some of our banks have put up interest rates significantly over the last two years, to know that you have options and the government of Bermuda has made it easier for you to move your mortgage to save money for your family. I would imagine that the government would have received lots of complaints about Absolutely. interest rates uh, in Bermuda or concerns banks. Uh, if I can move on, Premier, to another uh, subject, and that is artificial intelligence or AI, which is something that um, you've indicated that some government services will benefit from. Mm -hmm. For example, I understand that um, it is already extended to part of the Department for Immigration. And so I'm just trying to get uh, a sense from you uh, as to what the public can expect as far as AI in our public services. So from that aspect, what this budget also represents is a significant increase of investment into IT capital infrastructure. The government already boosted IT capital spending levels about 70% a few years ago, and now we're having to increase those further, certainly as a result of the cyber attack to make sure that we are more prepared in the future because these threats will always be here and exist. But from the perspective of how does artificial intelligence help with government, it's important to note our throne speech this year was service the people. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that we can increase customer service throughout government. Artificial intelligence is a tool that will enable public officers to serve the public better. And so in this government, we are certainly going to be investing funds inside of programs that will allow government services to utilize artificial intelligence. But we are also launching a pilot program with the Department of Immigration. They are the first, and this is a partnership that was announced between ABIC, which is uh, the Association of Bermuda International Companies, who answered the call from government to say, we're looking for a partner to work with us. We know that there are companies in Bermuda who are doing this for the private sector, and we want to implement that in the public sector as well. The first space is immigration, where there are complex applications which can be read through by artificial intelligence, give people immediate responses, whether or not to say you need additional information or some items are missing. And what that will do is that will free frontline employees to work on the more difficult tasks that are required. And so from that perspective, that is just an example of what people will see. It will enable us to provide government servers better and more efficiently and use as a tool to help public officers, not to replace public officers. And on that uh, sentiment, I mean, I'm 
to those who may have read media reports from overseas mm -hmm. and heard different things about AI, AI has its benefits, doesn't it? Oh, it absolutely has its benefits. Um, it has its benefits, especially when there are repetitive tasks or the types of things which we're looking at, which governments deal with often, dealing with numbers of applications, dealing with how to find out what's the best way to approach situations, gathering data and analyzing that data. And so we want to make sure that public officers have the use of it, but we also need to make sure that we're investing in training and development so they can make best use of the new tools that be available, and this budget funds that. Mr. Premier, another subject uh, that was mentioned in the budget uh, that uh, you highlighted, and that was under the Ministry of Economy and Labor, I believe, and that's the family, family offices, which is a fairly new concept for us, I believe. Um, you indicated that the ministry will be creating a a framework for these family offices and for the general public what are these offices and how do they benefit the economy well family offices have been something that has been in Bermuda for a while but we do have a new initiative to make sure to upgrade our family office framework which is something that the Ministry of Economy and Labor has been working on and we're seeing that it's yielding benefits for example we signed an agreement with the Emirates Family Office Association, and family officers are for large, wealthy families who place their monies and basically create private companies to manage those funds. And we want to make sure that more of those family offices, especially from the Gulf region, have branches here in Bermuda so that they can go ahead and invest in Bermuda and invest from Bermuda. That creates more jobs and more economic activity here. And one of the things that we've always wanted to do is continue to attract investment to our shores because investment creates jobs over the long term, secure and stable jobs. And that is where the government is focused. And if I can talk about a, another subject uh, widely discussed, and that's what the government is doing to sustain the public service superannuation fund. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an important topic because we do know that our pension funds are challenged and not for any reason of what has happened inside of the government. That is just what has happened around the world. As people live longer, pensions need to make sure they have more contributions or more funds in them in order to meet the expenses as people are living longer. So that is something that we see globally. We've been engaged in a body of work to make sure that we can stabilize these funds. And what I announced the budget statement is that we, the cabinet has approved the changes which have been under consultation with unions for a while to make sure that we can make these funds stable. Why does that matter to the everyday Bermudian? It matters because the public sector pensions are something that is a charge, as it's called, on the consolidated fund or the government, or basically the people of Bermuda. And if there is a shortfall, that means that those funds have to be paid, and that will result in higher taxes down the road for residents and businesses. In this action, we are fixing it, so we are basically eliminating that threat that in the future there will be a need for higher taxes from the public in order to meet these particular commitments. And so from that aspect, we're pleased with our work, but we also need to work on the social insurance fund, which is what provides social insurance for everyone in the country. And people are worried that that fund will not be there. And in the budget statement, I made it clear that we will be working on making sure that we can make that fund sustainable. We will be possibly looking, has been recommended by international business, to supplement that fund with revenues from the corporate income tax to make sure that social insurance is there for the future and people have confidence in paying into those funds. And we will certainly see that that fund will also be able to be put on a secure footing so that people will know that the pension money at which they're paying in will be there for them when they retire. And as we wind down our conversation, Premier, I want to give you a chance to sort of leave any final thoughts on the, the budget. Well, the budget is what the government is planning on making sure that we carry out this year. We have a throne speech, 
and it doesn't mean anything unless you put the resources behind it to make sure that we execute. So whether it's dealing with the conditions of our roads, whether it's making sure that our bridges are safe and secure, whether it's making sure to invest in new technology in our hospitals so we have the latest and best treatments that will be available to persons, or whether or not it is our significant and investment in affordable housing. Those are the things of which this budget presents. There are no new taxes in this budget. There are no new fees. And what we will do also is make sure that we use the benefits of our collective sacrifice to achieve this balanced budget and share those benefits with the people of this country. It means nothing if the government has had a better than expected financial performance if the people do not feel it. And in this case and instance where we have said that we are going to freeze health insurance rates for the third year running, saving families or policyholders $540 a year, that is real savings. And so that is what the people can expect from their government in this particular budget. And they should know that we are always focused on reducing the burden for the working and average Bermudian as much as we can. This budget builds on a history of budgets of where we've done that, and we look forward to everyone tuning into the debate and also finding out more information. And I will put in my own shameless plug, you can always find information on the government budget by going to gov.bm slash budget. All said, uh, thank you, uh, Premier, for your time and for agreeing to come in today to discuss this very important uh, subject. Thank you. And you've been watching a wide-ranging interview with our Premier and Minister of Finance, the Honorable David Burt. The Premier has certainly enlightened us today, and it's greatly appreciated. To our viewers, we encourage you to learn more about this year's 2024-25 budget and how it affects you. As the Premier mentioned, please visit gov.bm forward slash budget to read more. And that wraps up our program. I'm Tarai Trott. Thank you for watching.